All right, uh, good morning, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really excited uh, to have a panel here today, uh, a business discussion uh, generally around how to build a case for OpenStack in your organization. And I'm thrilled with the three panelists because I think you're going to hear uh, a lot of different perspectives. Uh, let me just do really, really quick introductions. Uh, just, just to my left here is Matt Haynes from Time Warner, uh, Andy Salo from RGB Networks, and Doug Soltes from Bud Van Lines. Um, and instead of them giving you their bios, what I thought I'd do is I, I have them each go through just quick their infrastructure today and what they're doing with OpenStack. So Matt, why don't you go ahead and, sure. and start. So, uh, so yeah, I work at Time Warner Cable. Um, we have a, a fairly expansive infrastructure, as you can imagine, supporting both our, the IT side of our business as well as what we call the subscriber side, uh, which is the side that serves all of our video, uh, broadband, and phone to customers. Um, that entire set of infrastructure uh, is, is, um, is fairly classical um, in, its, in the way it's put together and deployed today. And uh, so we're on a mission to, to revolutionize that, put that into a, more of a, an on-demand, as-a-service offering. And OpenStack is one of the tools I'm using to, uh, to pull that off. And, and, and before Time Warner, you were at HP I was, building out I, some of their OpenStack apps yeah, as well. Yeah, I, I ran the engineering group for the uh, HP Public Cloud. So, so a lot, lot of experience. I've been yeah. around uh, this, <laughs> this game for a little while now. Andy. Uh, Andy Salo. Uh, so I uh, run product at RGB Networks, and we uh, build basically IP video delivery products, software and hardware solutions, and we sell to uh, uh, companies like uh, Comcast or Time Warner, or I guess just Comcast. Sort of. <laughs> uh, no comment. <laughs> um, and we build a lot of software solutions, um, and we've started to basically cloudify all of those. And, and you know, I can describe what all those mean. But really, for us, it was it's it's it was just the natural evolution of where we were heading with our products and how our, our customers were deploying their products and what we wanted to do internally from a hosted environment and testing perspective. So what's what I think will be interesting to talk more about is you actually go into customers with your product and install with OpenStack. That's right. Yes. Yep. So, so very interesting. Doug? So in our environment, we're uh, an end user of uh, OpenStack technologies. Most recently, we started using Swift, and uh, we're, we're actually training and looking at Ceph. We've always been uh, trying to keep ahead of larger moving and storage companies. We're one of the largest independents, but competing with their resources means that we've got to be maybe a little bit more bleeding edge. So you know, we certainly virtualized uh, way back in 2006, earlier than other companies. Uh, today we're looking at you know, how can we cloud enable our drivers out in the field? Um, how can we uh, better manage disaster recovery, um, storage rollouts, um, you know, everything like that. So we're a classical customer you know, changing over to the OpenStack approach as it's maturing against proprietary systems. So, so interesting. So, so, you know, from a van line perspective, let's just, you know, start with you. It's a, from a somewhat traditional kind of enterprise company. What, what was the core problem, really, that you were trying to solve with, with OpenStack? So, the, we didn't have necessarily a core problem. We have problems all the time, and we constantly are solving those problems. And so, you know, way back, it was virtualization. We, our servers were getting to be too much. Uh, today, it's more we have an infrastructure that's aging because you know, computers are durable products. And so as our backup disaster recovery was aging, we were saying, you know, this isn't keeping up. Uh, the issues that we're having is, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, we got hit by um, uh, the hurricane on the East Coast, Superstorm Stan Sandy. Uh, we had a little bit of downtime there. Uh, we're nationwide. And it just seems like, you know, with the Blackberries, with the iPhones, you know, we've really moved, even though we're uh, an independent uh, van line to being a 24-hour operation. There are times when we're down at 3 o'clock in the morning for maintenance and I actually get emails from users. So um, I needed to improve our disaster recovery. And so we started uh, most recently using uh, Swift as a backup disaster recovery replication and just something that's really durable uh, because at the end of the day, previous solutions we've used, whether that's tape and, and a lot of tape, um, you know, tapes fail, drives fail. There's just so many points of failure. And really, as we move forward, we want to do the same thing for less cost at a faster delivery speed with less points of failure. And that's what we recently found with Swift, and that's what we're looking at 
with uh, Ceph and other technologies. And, and what, what in a, in a, from a disaster recovery standpoint, there's obviously there's a lot of solutions out there that could solve, that could solve your problem. What, what drove you to Swift? What, you know, what drove you into to OpenStack and, and looking at that as an answer? So, uh, you know, it, we always have to look at proprietary. Uh, so I'm saying right here, and I just heard somebody's phone go off with an email message. I'm sure I have emails right now from EMC, Dell, HP, saying, hey, let's go to lunch and talk about this proprietary solution that we can offer you. And that's what we're using today. Uh, when we start looking at a technology like Swift, it's more because we went out and we started looking at what technologies can solve our problem. And the hard thing is they don't have the same marketing team. It really has to be more on us to figure out these OpenStack technologies could enable us. And then we have to build a business case um, around these technologies. So, for example, recently you know, we were looking at these deduplication products, and every company out there has them, EMC, Dell, HP. When you're looking at these deduplication products against OpenStack Swift, they've got these marketing magics, right? So you're buying, let's say, 30 terabytes, but you can get a, in certain environments, a 300 to 1 deduplication. You can get a 50 to 1, or you could get a this, or you could get a that, and that's their proprietary magic. Whereas when we look at Swift, we know we've got this many objects, we've got this many terabytes, and we've got this price per terabyte. And so comparing them isn't really apples to oranges. It can really make it tough to um, determine the actual TCO um, of an OpenStack solution. Um, really, it came down to how many times we've done uh, forklift upgrades. So time and time again, We've deployed a solution, whether any sand that we've ever used. They've told us that, ah, in the future, you'll just be able to scale up, scale out. And then a few years later, they went, well, we don't offer fiber channel drives anymore. You have to have a completely different you know, infrastructure. We don't offer this. We don't offer that. And we've always gone back to the market, which I think any company should do, and said, hey, it's been three years. Staying with my existing vendor may be the right choice. But more often, there's something new, something disruptive out there. And in this example, uh, most recently, it was Swift, was the That's disruptive great. example. That's great. We're going to come back to TCO here in a minute, because I think it's a good topic. But Matt, let me ask you, again, just to do a contrast, big service provider, big infrastructure, uh, a lot of probably you know, different groups inside that have different opinions about what the direction is to go. Yep. What, what was the problem? I mean, you came in obviously a believer, having been at HP in terms yep. of what you know, uh, OpenStack could do. Uh, so, so what was the problem uh, there that you saw that you could go tackle and talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, it, you know, and it's important that I've said before, I wasn't hired to deploy OpenStack, right? So, so you know, I sat down and, and uh, Michael Joy, who's the CTO's office, and he said, look, we have three problems you need to go help fix. One is uh, it's too slow to, de to deploy, develop and deploy applications. It's way too slow. You know, we're, we live in a world where it can take weeks to deploy a VM. Um, uh, the second problem is really around scaling our infrastructure with reliability. We have so much infrastructure, we have lots of data centers, but it's difficult to present to the application developers at Time Warner a consistent model of HA and DR capabilities. So a lot of applications get built without all of those features built in. So that causes outages, which, which bothers Mike. <laughs> uh, right. And the third one is cost. He said, look, I spend too much money. And then he showed me how much we spent. I said, yeah, we spend way too much money on infrastructure. Um, and so that's... And is it money, that, both CapEx and OpEx? Both. Both, both CapEx and both. OpEx. We're, we're a very heavy CapEx shop. That's yeah. basically what cable companies do is they leverage CapEx to print money. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a good business model. Um, but Turns but but that's those are the those are the problems we're trying to solve. For right. me, OpenStack is one of the tools that's well suited to make progress against all three of those. It lets us deploy uh, with low cost because of the commoditization of the hardware underneath. You know, the intelligent software layer drives the smarts right down to commodity hardware. Right. Um, it, uh, it it allows obviously us to deploy a system the entire infrastructure we're turning it over to as a service, you know, what we call cloud, which to me has the properties of 
self-provisioning, multi-tenancy, metered, right, uh, automated. And so all of those help drive fast uh, deployment as, as everyone who's used OpenStack knows. Um, and it allows us, and, and I'll point to Swift as well, you know, we, we are deploying Swift in two national data centers with one ring and four copies. So not only do we have local HA in each data center, we have DR, I can lose a whole data center. So really and, solving the reliability. And I have all, yeah, and we can offer that then to our customers who are all the application developers at Time Warner Cable in a real consistent way and say, look, we've enabled you to go build DR applications now. Put all of your state in Swift at some point you don't have to leave it there, right? You can bring it back up into Sender or whatever you need, Glance, but, but if it's there, it's available. We can lose the entire data center and you have it, right? So, right. so those are the problems we're solving. That's great. And so Andy, you know, just to contrast with, with you guys, with very unique, right? Where you're actually using it almost as part of your product. That's right. Um, you, know, it's, you know, it's interesting. We've, you know, we listen to our customers and so people like Time Warner are, are doing exactly the thing that Matt is highlighting of, you know, they want to leverage commodity hardware uh, that they know they can purchase on different cycles, different budget cycles, and then put whatever software applications they need on those, that, that commodity hardware and deploy it as, as whenever needed and do it much more quickly. So what we saw was, number one, we were listening to our customers, and number two, um, because of the way we've taken our kind of just our software product direction, we were building, we were going from really kind of point products such as transcoding and packaging to more solution uh, sets of products for doing like NDVR and ad insertion. And when you do that, you started, you, you basically start to have an ecosystem of applications that need to talk to each other. And when you have an ecosystem, what better way to orchestrate that ecosystem than through a, a cloud-based application like OpenStack? So right. it became, it was just a natural fit for our product direction and a natural fit for what our customers were already trying to do in their environment. That's great. So um, I want to mention everybody too, I'm going to try and take some questions from the audience. So if you have some, uh, you know, start thinking of some and I'll, I'll take some here in a minute. Uh, but let, me, let, me, let me turn to actually how you got OpenStack moving inside of your organizations, because I would say all three of you are still relatively early adopters in the process. I mean, there are lots of good production use cases now with OpenStack, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's probably not necessarily the easy decision, I should say, inside of, a, of an organization. Um, maybe, Matt, maybe start, start with you. I mean, just sure. in terms of kind of how, how did you build that case? Uh, was, there, was there pushback? What were the friction points? And kind of how, how did you think about that inside, of, inside the organization? Um. No, I mean, to be honest, there wasn't a lot of uh, pushback. The, you know, the objectives I mentioned were given to me, yeah. and, and it was up to me to go figure out how to solve it. Um, so really, I had to convince myself that this was the, you know, the best approach. Uh, having familiarity with it, knowing, knowing this beast, if you will, um, you didn't. You didn't have any pressure to. I don't know. You know, AWS. Hey, it's a great solution. Hey, you know, Matt, why don't you go? Why? You know, I hear these. Oh, OpenStack, yeah. You know, in our case, again, we're a little different. Maybe we are a networking company. We are yeah. an infrastructure company. Yeah. Right. So outsourcing that to AWS is not. Right. I don't think it's the right decision for a company. That we should have that core competence. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so. Uh, eventually, I think, you know, now in the back of my mind, am I planning to, you know, compete with them on price level internally? Absolutely, right? We have to make those decisions to be ready to do that. Right. Uh, but, but the, you know, there wasn't really, uh, there wasn't a case that I had to make uh, to the management. Uh, they, they've, they've given me the confidence. <laughs> they've given me the, they've given me the gun and I'm trying That's not good. to hit, my, you, hit myself with they've it. They've given but, you the uh, rope. Yeah, right. They really have. <laughs> um, and, and I, I mean, maybe it would have been harder had I not done this for a couple of years right. back to when it was really hard. Right. Uh, sort of Diablo time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, but no, it's, you know, I, I had the confidence this would, this would be, and I said, it's one part of a broader solution we're deploying. Uh, it's not the only thing. We're sure. not just doing, I'm not replacing everything we've got with OpenStack. Right. Uh, but it's an important component, not just because of the, the cost metrics it brings to the table when we deploy it, but also the, the philosophy that it gives our developers for scale out architecture, for rapid development. It, you know, they need that as well, right? They're, they, they're looking to, to move in that direction as well. When, when you get a VM once every six weeks, you don't really have a scale out architecture in your head when you're building, right? So, so it, it drives that mentality as well. Did you have, to, I would imagine, just back to the AWS point, being yeah. agile, if it takes six weeks to get a VM, I mean, that, I love how you describe your customers, the internal application developers, because yeah. I love that mindset. Uh, 
were people starting to look to other yeah, other ways? Uh, to... Some, yeah, you know, some of, some of the folks, especially some of the folks. I mean, it's an, it's relatively a sort of traditional business, right? It yeah. grew up in the '80s, and and so the people that do the core applications have been around for a while. But you know, folks that run our website properties and a lot of the new applications that are being developed, right? You can get you can get your Time Warner lineup on an iPad. Right. Uh, we encode it and stream it live. Uh, you know, this IPT, you know, the IPTV part of our business is, is really growing. And, and all of the services that support that kind of application are modern. And those are the folks that are dying for, the, you know, for something like this, right? Right, right? So yes, they've been poking around at AWS and, yeah. and you know, uh, wondering when we could get something. So they're, they're, they're kind of lined up. And, uh, well, they'll <laughs> wait, become your biggest they're supporters. They're lined up. And when we're, you know, we, uh, we're... Uh, we're almost open for business for them, so. Oh, that's good. Well, Doug, I imagine in your company, it was probably a little bit different story. Yeah, we, we're, we're constantly battling. So, <laughs> you know, whenever I spend money, it's, it's we're, our core competency, we're a trucking company. So if I spend $100,000 on a solution, I just took a truck off the road, and that truck is a revenue generator. Whereas some of these other companies on stage, you know, they're making revenue from the technology, mm -hmm. and that's not where I'm at. So. First, I have to convince somebody that we need this core competency. So let's say virtualization. We did that you know, many years ago. Once I convince them that we need this core competency, then the next thing is it needs to be supported. And, and that can be kind of tough. When we virtualized, uh, at the time, Microsoft was not supporting uh, Exchange and a bunch of business critical applications on virtualization. But virtualization was such a critical uh, technology that we did anyway. Today. Um, when I go into the board and, and I'm arguing for uh, a product like Swift, if I convince them that we need this new um, backup disaster recovery solution, they're going to say, well, what's a Swift? Who's Swift stack? And I go, well, they're, they're, they're going to give me the enterprise support. And they're going to go, but this other company is using EMC. And I just golfed with them the other day. And in fact, <laughs> we're trying to get into their accounts. Why not use EMC? And the thing that will happen is I'm going to lose that argument because my company gives a, a high level white glove service and they expect our customers to pay more for the service we're providing because it's a superior service and they see the same thing when they hear the name brands right they hear IBM they hear HP they have they hear EMC they're expecting that same white glove service and that we're getting what we pay for so the argument that I go in with more often than not is not to say that um, this EMC product against this they've never heard of before, right? Swift Stack product. What I do is I go in and say, we need better disaster recovery. And EMC has these products, but have you heard of the cloud? And of course, it's in the Fortune magazines, and they've all heard of the cloud. And I go, you know, we can send the state up there. It can, it, we can hold it. it, can, it we can have it longer. It's not proprietary. It has all these different things. And cloud can be EMC in an argument. So it's kind of like rock, paper, scissors, <laughs> right? EMC can get beaten by cloud, but EMC could be, say, Swift Stack. However, once you've convinced them that we need to do disaster recovery that's dynamic and using a cloud-based technology, then you come back a few weeks later and say, we have determined the cloud-based technology we want to use. We want to use Swift Stack because we want to have this cloud be a private cloud on-premise, still get the uh, cost effectiveness, all of the things we sold you on in cloud, and so now you're not having EMC or Dell or NetApp battle against your, your smaller technology. You've convinced them of a, you've kind of gone non-linear. You've convinced them that they need this other technology. And then you've picked the proper provider of that technology. But you certainly still want support. You know, obviously with going with Ceph, we're looking at Ink Tank. Uh, we use a ZFS-based um, uh, NAS today. Um, we buy our support from Nixenta because, you know, we like these technologies, um, but we need support. The only other thing I can comment on with that is I was in a uh, session yesterday, and I, it was on um, Ceph with Think Tank, and Dell was there. And at the end, they had a reference architecture, and that really helps because I can tell you that, you know, I had to make a much bigger argument for Nixenta a few years ago. But today, doing Ceph or Nixenta, I can maybe eke it in where I go, well, we're going to compare the you know, HP left-hand solution to the Dell Nixenta or the Dell Ceph solution. As soon as they hear that bigger name company, right. and you can show them that reference architecture, 
all of a sudden the butterflies in their stomach kind of subside a little bit. But you know, it's definitely every project is a battle. And I don't want to say I have to trick my board because I hope they don't see this. But um, you do. You have to you know, bring them to the, to the answer you've come to. And sometimes that is still staying with the proprietary technology. You know, we're not looking at open compute today because we have virtualized on VMware. And just because Microsoft did not support them at the time, you know, now it's all supported. To move now to open compute, well, gee, I already have a big investment. It's working well, and I don't want to lose some of that support or pay the additional licensing. Right, um, right. Well, that, uh, that, it, that's great. The, may, may it's a good time to just transition to this concept of, you know, kind of TCO seems to be a big discussion point with OpenStack uh, when it's getting deployed. Uh, because you're shifting uh, to what looks like potentially a very agile, low-cost, open-source solution, but as we all know, there's no free lunch. Uh, and certainly in the early days, Diablo days of OpenStack, it was kind of a bag of bolts. It took a lot of work to put it together. It's gotten a lot, it's gotten a lot better today. Uh, maybe Andy, you, you can just start off talking, you know, how, how do you guys think about TCO and making that case and kind of the trade-offs uh, internally? Because obviously you could go with a turnkey solution and, and it would work, but you know, maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, so internally, we, uh, I'm almost on like two different fronts. There's sort of the internal selling, you know, and then there's the internal selling for how we position our products, right? So, um, and, and part of it's just the, the internal selling is like eat our own dog food, right? So we, we want to, uh, you know, be agile, uh, deploy quickly. Um, you know, the, the same things that I was positioning for the board, you know, I had that similar board discussion. Um, that was a little bit challenging, but um, uh, you know the same thing that you have to position for. Here's a go-to-market approach for you know how we should do this. Uh, it turns out that that actually is a great thing to do internally as well, and just how you develop uh, the products and how you kind of deploy um, both internally and in a hosted environment. So um, you know our uh, some of our customers face the same challenges of well, I want to go deploy something and have the design and uh, engineering group create that environment, but then I have to go turn it over to operations. Right? And so they have that challenge of they want to replicate that in, a, in, a, in an operational fashion. Uh, we have that same challenge internally of, well, I got to develop it and then I have to turn it over to system test and then eventually to customers. And I want to do that in a very uh, cookie cutter way if possible. OpenStack is great for that if I'm orchestrating with heat or, or, or anything else for that matter, but, but using uh, heat templates to basically create an environment on the fly and build and, and tear down environments, uh, it makes my internal development job a lot easier. And, and did you, you know, internally, one of the, one of the uh, things I hear often in talking to enterprise customers is, hey, I have a lot of VMware trained engineers, uh, but I don't have anybody that knows OpenStack. How did you guys deal with that uh, internally? Uh, that, that we had a, exactly that challenge, right? Huh. Um, so uh, in fact, both in customer environments and internally, you know, we use VMware all the time, right? right? And, uh, so it's a, it's a different, you know, it takes a different uh, um, set, set of a, um, just a different way of thinking, uh, but one of the things that we did was created a, an internal, uh, both internal and external, a, a deployment tool for making it turnkey, right? So I basically, you know, we had a team that uh, created a tool that would just deploy OpenStack, build up our environment, our instances, our software applications, put it all on it, configure it, you know, all you have to do is press a button and then go get a cup of coffee, and then you come back and you have an open stack environment. So just making it easier making for it people easy. yeah. to adopt it was was pretty key. But how about how about in your organization? I, I imagine, you know, like the whole concept of TCO, understanding those the hidden costs and kind of yeah. thinking uh, through all of that. Uh, it's, it's it's probably very complicated uh, and and hard to get your arms around. How, how do you guys think about that? No, TCO is 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 difficult with OpenStack, right? You 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 know, I always view it like a balance sheet, and sometimes I, I say, you know, open source is free, but it's not cheap. <laughs> um, you, you you have on the on the positive side of the balance sheet, you have things like you can it, it, it drives commodity hardware. Now that that gives me better better opportunity to work with multiple vendors at the sort of most basic level that they sell. Um, you know, it, it certainly has attractive license fees for the software itself, right? It you know, so there's a number of things that make it uh, you know that are that are positive on the balance sheet, but but anybody looking at deploying OpenStack really has to also focus on the, the what I'll call the hidden costs, right? The hidden costs are things like you're going to have to have support, 
right? So while the software itself might be free, you're going to pay Canonical, you're going to pay Swift Stack, you're going to pay Ink Tank, you're going to pay the folks to yeah. give you the support, the Red Hats, mm -hmm. the you know the folks who are going to who are going to who are going to stand behind this software and who know how to configure it and set it up and run it well, right? You're also going to have uh, you're going to have expenses in building some internal expertise, right? You you know at a, certainly at a level we run it, you know when you're when you're you know sort of you know, see, you know, not to give away you know, actual numbers, but in CS notation, you know, big O notation, we're in the O100 range, right? So um, that covers me from like 100 to 1,000, if I remember. Um, you know, when you're on that kind of many nodes, you know, you have to have an internal competence, uh, and it's and it's a different level of of effort than than it would be, say, to run you know a VMware product um, out the door. So you'd be willing to invest in, say, a team. Um, that, that's going to have that. There's, you know, the the problems that the biggest problems that plague Diablo, a lot of those exist today, which are the operational issues for OpenStack. Standing it up to get Nova running is not hard. Operating it is difficult, right? The operational issues of operational monitoring, you know, co you know, really good billing and metering, um, all the issues it takes to run this thing. Um, take a skill set, and you have to be willing to invest in that. So when you're looking at OpenStack, yes, it's free, but you're gonna have costs, you're gonna have, you're gonna like have a, support. Free like a puppy, not free like a beer. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and, and you're gonna just have to, it, it, it can be challenging to put those into all into a spreadsheet, um, though we do try to, to you know, my, uh, my uh, management does like to see numbers, and so we have taken a swing at putting some of these things down for them to do comparisons for, for TCO against, some, against the vendor product. But they are sometimes surprised that there's actual cost there. I, would, I thought it was free. <laughs> okay. okay. So how, do you, how do you guys look at, at TCO? Is it a sim similar kind of way? Oh, definitely. So um, there are definitely a lot of hidden costs. Um, again, I echo, you, you have to use support, right? I don't want to stand up you know, a Swift install that I have no support on. I don't want to stand up you know, a ZFS install, any of those. Um, because at the end of the day, you don't want to be the guy holding the torch when something goes wrong, and things do go wrong. Um, I would echo that you know definitely trying to to get people with training. So you know it's much easier to get somebody with VMware training. Um, I think a great thing in the OpenStack and the the community is the ability to get training uh, kind of first. So for example, we don't have any Ceph deployment, and yet next week we're sending people to Ceph training. Uh, I guess you could do the same thing with VMware, but again, going back to it runs on any um, hardware. So we have test servers that may not meet, if I was going to be doing open compute today, that may not meet, say, VMware's HCL list. And if we download it and we try it free, you know, we might crash and have a bad time, whereas you know, KVM's going to run fine. We're going to be able to do that. We're gonna get tick, I'm sorry, we're going to be able to kick the tires a little bit better right. because just because it's uh, OpenStack doesn't mean that we're going to do it, you know, because it's cheaper. It's got to work. It's got to, we've got to be confident in it. So um, we will have you know, normally probably about a six month um, testing period. And that's more than when I call EMC or I call NetApp and I say, hey, I want to test your SAN. They're, they're pretty glad to send me something small, but they're not glad to let me test it for six months. You know, it's, they want a, if it meets these requirements within a certain period of time, you will purchase. Um, whereas I can grab commodity hardware, uh, so my engineers can take stuff home. They can play with this in VMs in their own environment. So it, it really kind of helps the whole kick the tire approach and see, you know what, this isn't up to snuff yet. We're going to wait on it. We're going to go ahead with this proprietary solution. Do something else. Yeah. Andy, let me let me go, come back to you. Um, when you, when you were looking at OpenStack uh, and thinking about it, what, what were the biggest deficiencies? I mean, what you know, from looking at it as an enterprise customer, you know, you're a real user. You're not, you know, you're running a business. This isn't about a you know developer. Hey, it's cool to play with. You mm -hmm. you, you got a job to do. What what struck you as big? What's really deficient uh, today with 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 OpenStack? Um, yeah, so there's a few things. Uh, you know, I would say first of all, Havana and now IceHouse have made some of these things better already, but yeah. uh, things like, for instance, you know, the orchestration. And that, Havana was really when you guys stepped yeah, in. Yeah, Havana, into, you know, okay. we were, uh, Grizz, we started out with Grizzly, but immediately with Grizzly, you know, we need, we're uh, focused on the orchestration aspect, and so Havana, including Heat, um, right. was, a, was a big plus. Um, 
you know, but it's it's really the orchestration. It's um, you know, it's uh, monitoring challengers uh, with a salometer and making sure you can kind of monitor the environment. It's um, you know, for video, there's an aspect of of multicast, right? And that's something that's not talked about much in an OpenStack environment. That but you really need multicast uh, in, to deliver video. So that's you know, that's still actually an ongoing challenge. So there's there are a number of things that you know need to be solved, but that's good for people like us because then then we get to be the ones that solve that. Right. So you actually working on contributing things like multicast, you know? Yeah, absolutely. We're doing things within the networking realm just to try to make sure that our applications work well and therefore video applications in general work well yeah. uh, in an OpenStack environment. So Matt, you mentioned operationalizing. It sounds like that that's probably when you think of OpenStack and the biggest efficiencies, you know, tool, the tools are great, standing it up, the basics, but really the operational yeah, I think I think operating a, a you know a large scale deployment is challenging, right? The, the the community has done a great job with with not just the services but a lot of tools. But sometimes you know again there's you know unlike a like a you know a vendor who takes a very you know directed path to, you know to putting out solutions. You know the you know the open source community. What's great about it is it it kind of moves in a chaotic and parallel fashion. And you know things come out with many options, and 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 eventually a, a winning choice usually survives, but but you know it does leave us choices sometimes. So sometimes there's there's no choice or too many choices. Um, there's still deficiencies. Um, I, I I go back to operational monitoring as one of these. Um, you know when you're running it and and you're running it at a large scale, and you're trying to figure out are my services up, are they healthy, is everything working, you know. You have to collect information from the from the message queues, from the logs on every host, and, and everything else. And there's no, there's no there's no good way yet to. Although, I I, I think uh, I think our friends at HP have, have recently uh, released something in the open source community that, that that helps to address that 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 block. But those are some of the gaps that they get. They're starting to get better, but it's still the operational complexities of a large OpenStack deployment are still challenging. Yeah, I mean. I mean you know, you think about how many large-scale OpenStack deployments there are today. There's just there's not that many. There's not that so, many. So, so yeah. you know, pe people are learning. It's I like kind of you know. I, I wrote this blog post last week called "End of the Beginning," where I kind of <laughs> feel like we're we're past the stage of anyone's questioning that it'll work. <laughs> yeah. But we're not quite at the stage yet where there's you know massive large-scale deployments. So. I, I will say though that that more people are are willing to take this on um, first time than than you know you've seen you have you know the. You know, just the attendance of this kind of a audience, you know, this kind of a conference shows that yeah. um, people are people are are I think invested in this. this is gonna this is gonna work. Yeah, yeah. Just that, in that in that post I was mentioning, you know, about ten thousand. I was at reInvent last year, and there's about uh, AWS reInvent. There's about ten thousand people there. Uh, I know what they're saying about forty seven hundred uh, here. So yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it seems it seems real. Well, let me turn to the the audience. Are there any any questions uh, from the audience? Yes, yes, sir. That's a great question. Let me just repeat it so everybody can hear. So the, the question was, you know, talk a little bit about ROI in terms of how am I going to make a return on my investment uh, against uh, against OpenStack, and, and how did uh, folks make that case internally? So, well, I, you know, again, for us, it's it's fairly straightforward because the business model is set up to make money off of infrastructure. That's right? true. Um, so, <laughs> so for me, if I lower the cost of the infrastructure, I I, I increase the ROI. Right? Because, but but the engine is already set up to leverage infrastructure to, to, to deliver services that, that, that we charge for. So for me, that's it's sort of built in. I would say two two quick ones for for us were um, number one, of course, enabling a service and helping sell our, our software applications as a service uh, and as a as a um, solution set. Um, and the second is is really agility internally in developing and testing. You know, working in a you know continuous integration Jenkins kind of model, deploying new builds, new releases, getting things out there very quickly, and getting through you know automated testing done very quickly. You know, not everything for us has a has a good ROI. I got to be honest. So you know, tapes are still one of the cheapest um, mediums out there, and you'd be hard pressed to to beat a truckload of uh, tapes. You know, I got big trucks. You fill a truck full of tapes and you drive it from New Jersey to California, I bet you I can beat any fiber link in the world with the amount of throughput because I can get that truck there in a week. So, you know, 
it, it, it's hard. You, you have to start looking at things that aren't dollars and cents. I have to start saying things like, well, you know, this tape, you know, we, we do our backup at night and this tape sits there in the morning and it's, let's say, uh, the, the Saturday morning backup because Friday night, you know, the tape drives ran. When does that go off site? Well, that goes off site, you know, Monday. Well, what happens if everything burns down? Now, they don't like to hear that. Nobody wants to hear that. Um, but it's the same argument we make for getting a generator for anything else. A generator only has an ROI if you have a disaster. Yeah. You know, disaster recovery only has an ROI if you have a disaster. And a lot of the new technology makes it simpler and easier for me. But it, it, you're, you're playing a statistics game. And, and so I got to be honest, sometimes um, the ROI is worst and you got to win the argument by um, giving the technological benefits um, or the, hey, we can sleep better at night. Uh, yes. Yeah, I kind of want to follow up that, that last train of thought around disaster recovery. So clearly tapes are cheaper, but is there, a, is there some kind of a justification of operating a cloud environment that makes disaster recovery easier, more reliable, better, whatever, that helps in the justification of moving down this path? I think you've kind of, you guys have kind of talked about that. I thought maybe you could kind of elaborate on, on how much of that is part of your justification. So for us, um, we're, we're a different situation than other companies. We have offices nationwide. So I have the space and I have the electricity. And so that's kind of cheap for us. And you know, we have our headquarters in New Jersey. We're very centralized. We set up um, a DR site in California. But then we start to look at you know, scenarios. What happens if Jersey goes down in California? What happens if we get a virus because, you know, say we use Ubuntu. Let's say somebody writes an Ubuntu virus, or maybe you use Red Hat, somebody writes something like that, and it gets propagated through. So now we need secondary systems. We need to replicate and we need to go to say Swift and have it do an let's call it out of band replication that hopefully will survive a virus that attacks our SAN, a virus that you know wipes out something like that. So a lot of it's around the the fear that we're seeing today, right? And um, you know XP loss support, and we'll probably see a whole bunch of viruses related to that, and you know heart bleed and the stuff that NSA does. So as my company moves forward, even though we're a moving and storage company, Americans want. Um, to be able to pick up the phone and talk to one of our coordinators right now, and they don't want any downtime. And yet we all know that in our server environments, we need downtime and things like being able to motion VMs from one machine to another, you know, mitigates that. But uh, certainly for us, we went from having, you know, a headquarters and offsite backup to having a headquarters and a DR site to now having headquarters, DR sites, a DR site, and having our data distributed amongst all of our other sites. Um, because at the end of the day, it's affordable and tapes go bad, and yet data running on hard drives that's being CRC checked doesn't. And that's a winning argument. That's great. Yes? So I'd like to ask something fundamental. Uh, you're sitting in front of a board, not your company. The chairman looks at you and goes, what's a cloud? <laughs> Secondly, uh, why should we be a cloud-enabled company? And third of all, why should we be doing a cloud internally rather than relying on somebody like Amazon to do it for us? So I'd like to hear from all three of you. So back to you know what's a cloud? Um, you got to pick your term, right? So when when I had EMC duke it against cloud, well, right now, clouds in all the magazines. But if I had said cloud two years ago, they would have gone what? You know. So you've got to make sure that that you're keeping up with what the, the latest is in Forbes and whatnot and use the proper technology. So if your CEO doesn't know what a cloud is, you should know that ahead of time and you should use a different analogy in your meeting. So you need to make sure that you can um, definitely win that argument is, is what I'm going to say. Yep. And then also when we talk cloud, you know, we are using the Amazon, right? They are the name brand out there. That's what he's thinking of when he hears cloud. And then we start to make the points for well, we want to keep it in-house. We want to we want to use Swift Stack. We don't want to use the the S3 cloud. But let's face it. Even when I go through documentation of how to get my backup product to talk to the cloud, there's seven pages on how to connect to S3, and there's one on on Swift or or an Open Stack product. Right. Um, Anybody else want to? Sure. I, well, I'd say just real quickly for me, it's it's knowing your audience. So um, you know, 
internal selling is key, knowing, knowing what they're, what they, what, where they're coming from. So if they don't know cloud, then I, I talk about IDC with the market going from 47 billion to 107 billion by 2017, and that 451 report says that number one driver of, of cloud is internal private cloud for enterprises. Um, and you know, kind of show the, kind of paint the picture first, and then it's, and then it's talking about you know, if there are, is a TCO element or ROI, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to that. Let's get one more quick question, and then we'll have to we'll have to uh, end. It's just, just a quick follow-up. So I know that at TWC you said your business is infrastructure, so you're not really interested in sort of using hosted solutions. But at RGB and Bud, um, you know, given some of the deficiencies you mentioned, I'm wondering if you're constantly sort of reviewing the trade-offs with going to a hosted solution that's perhaps more mature that doesn't have some of the same issues, because things like DR and um, those sorts of solutions are available through availability zones and replication and things like that in hosted clouds as well. So just curious if that's something that you continually consider or are you really set on a strategy to use an on-premises uh, cloud with OpenStack? No, I, I would love to put everything in the cloud cloud. Um, I'm still a little fearful of the cloud. <laughs> um, so let's face it, if, if Anonymous is in the room, if they wanted to attack Bud Van Lines, I'm pretty sure they could get through our defenses. And I'm sure they're attacking Amazon and all these other people today, um, and they're not getting through. But when I put my data in the cloud with somebody else's more important data, I've, I've kind of I've grouped myself in with that potential. So again, I'm not saying that my security and my uptime is, is really, really high but um, compared to, say, Amazon. But we know that a few years ago they had the problem around Christmas, Netflix, you know, other services going down. When we went down for the hurricane, it was acceptable to our customers to say, hey, we had a day of downtime failing over and switching around because Superstorm Sandy hit the East Coast and we were one of the first companies back online. But if in the middle of a nice sunny day, we're down because we're using this cloud and they're down, that's not, they don't forgive that. So I would love to, and I think we will, and I think that's the future, but I need the cost to come down and I need I still have some butterflies in my stomach. Right. Well, let, let's, uh, uh, let, let's end that. I want to be sensitive everybody's time. Listen, I appreciate uh, everyone giving us your time and especially uh, the panelists. So let's give a big round of applause for everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>